In this lecture, I'll be going over unit two, proportion and volume. Proportion is the ratio between larger parts of the whole. And ratio is how two numbers compare. And you can think about it height times width. So for example, um, are we scaling something up? Or are we scaling something down? A one to three ratio would mean that an object that is one would be enlarged by three times in order to be three times larger. A ratio of three to one would be an, a large object that is three times smaller. In this example, I have Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. He is a really no, well-known Renaissance artist who explored no, um, scale and proportion, especially as it relates to human anatomy, which is the human body. For example, the human arm is typically almost as long as the human leg. So how, what is the proportion or the ratio of a human arm to a human leg? Proportion is very um, <clears throat> important to a drawing because it creates a believable space and it makes things look proportionate to one another. Scale. Scale is the comparative size. How big is one thing compared to another? Scale can be used in an artist's work to create emphasis or create meaning. So in this example here, we can see that the bow and the arrow is, the scale is much larger than human size or real size. So it is taking an everyday object that in real life appears to be much smaller and then making it monumental and gigantic by making a large sculpture of it. It changes how humans perceive themselves in relation to other things, for example. Now here's a more concrete example of how a designer or an artist could use scale in their work in a very practical way. Architects use proportion and ratio to make a small scale plan of a large scale building project. So for example, in a blueprint, perhaps one inch equals one foot. Now this is, this map isn't going to be the literal size of the apartment, of course, but it does help you get an understanding of how proportionate, for example, the bedroom is to the living room or the bathroom. And, and it's in a package that you're able to hold in your hands. The grid. So in this unit, we are going to be using a proportion tool called the grid or gridding. And its most basic term in a grid, there are two main distinctions, rows and columns. Rows go side to side, or they're horizontal. Columns go up and down, they are vertical. Now, the number of squares in a grid relates to the number of rows and columns. They dissect the squares to be, the more there are, the smaller the squares are gonna be, the more there will be in a relative um, composition. Maps are an example of how a designer would use a grid, proportion, and scale to mentally grasp a landscape. The grid is really helpful for making elements of the landscape proportionate to one another, but the grid is a way to help us understand the proportions of something in a more mathematical and logical way. And so this suggests a sense of control. Chuck Close is an example of an artist that uses gridding in his work. He's a photorealist painter, an American contemporary artist, and he has a lot of physical disabilities. The main one that challenges his work the most is called facial blindness. So when he sees a face, he cannot recognize it. And his main subject in his work is portraiture. So how do you paint a portrait of someone if you can't distinguish the different elements of a person's face. 
Well, you can use the grid. So here's an example of a piece far away and a piece close up. He uses the grid and then uses kind of a repeating motif um, and this helps him recognize and portray the face. So he'll just look at one little square at a time because that's how, that's how his mind breaks down things. And so there's very interesting optical illusions in his work. Um, you can see in this one he uses um, op an optical color mixture where um, green and red come together to make brown when you're standing far away. Um, all these little circles within the grids also start to blend together the further and further you step back, but it does appear to be, you know, pixelated from a distance still. Here's an image of um, his work in progress before he goes to map out a face. He will draw over a photograph like so. And you can see that the grid has many, many columns and many, many rows. And the more squares there are, the more detail or the more accuracy you can get. So if a square was this large, there would be a lot of areas where you'd have to draw by observation alone. But when it's just a small square, there's just like a smaller segment of line or a smaller shape that you have to connect um, to one another. Volume. Volume refers to the depiction of a three dimension of three dimensionality and mass in an artwork. Volume is to 3D as shape is to 2D. So we will go over that in just a minute in the next slide. You can see in these three examples of a, a hand-drawn cup that one has no volume at all, looks completely flat. The other look has the appearance of the most volume. Okay, so this here, this cup is the least realistic. You can see that it's got circles and kind of a square. Um, it looks like the you're looking down at a cup and at the side at the same time. Now this one has something called an ellipse, which I'll talk more about, but it's a circle at an angle and the ellipses go all the way throughout. Um, and then additionally, the sides and the handle are very well rendered. This is where most students draw at when they start to draw in volume. So it does have the illusion of three dimensionality, but the ellipse is still a little too tilted towards us. Um, and the edges still need to be worked out just a little more. The more you can pretend that you can see through an object to trace the inner shapes, the more three-dimensional it's going to look. Whereas this one, you can tell that the artist was not thinking about seeing through the object. It was just looking at the edges. But if you can think like an x-ray, it really does help you to make more three-dimensional looking drawings. And so we'll be learning a lot more about that this semester. So let's get into shape. Shape is 2D. Shapes are um, primarily geometric or organic. <clears throat> geometric shapes have crisp, precise edges and mathematically consistent curves or edges and are oftentimes rectilinear. So here's my geometric shape. The sides are equal, um, predictable, and has sharp corners here. An organic shape that's my example. These are shapes that are found in the natural world. Oftentimes they have irregular edges and are curvilinear. So these different edges are all different um, heights and widths and then often, well these all have curved edges. Although some shapes can appear to be geometric and organic at the same time as you can see from this example um, from, a, from a Muslim mock from an Islamic mosque. Forms are 3D. A form literally takes up space, has volume, and you can think about it as a shape in space 
So it has multiple sides. In this example, um, I have made a pyramid, and a pyramid is a version of a 3D version of a triangle, which is the 2D shape. Additionally, in this uh, unit, we're going to be talking about planes. So a plane is not the thing that flies in the sky in this unit. This, in this unit, planes refer to the side of a form that goes in a specific direction. So if you were to feel the pyramid, um, you would be able to tell that your hands are going in a couple different directions. There's four sides when you, you see that from the top and then there's also a side on the bottom. So you can think about planes as a side. It would feel distinct when you touch each one. You could tell that they are going at different angles or going in different directions. And another example um, would be a cube. So a cube is a 3D square and it has six planes, so it has four sides and a top and a bottom side. Let's talk about some of those basic forms. First we have a sphere. A sphere is a 3D version of a circle. A cube is the 3D form of a square or rectangle. The pyramid is a 3D form of a triangle, and it can either be three-sided or four-sided. A cone is a 3D form of a triangle as well, but with a circular base, and a cylinder is a 3D form of, with parallel sides and a circular base. Another technique we can use in this unit is cross contour line, and this is a really helpful way to think about the direction of different planes. Cross contour lines are like contour lines which define the edge, but Rather than just defining the outside edge of the hand, for example, there are lines going across it. So you can imagine just by the directions of these lines and the length and the curvature how this hand would feel if you touched it. So cross contour lines can go across or they can also go up and down. Now if they are going up and down and side to side, it almost gives the illusion of a globe, for example. So I'm going to show you in the demo video how to use cross contour line, and it really helps define the volume of an object. For example, if you think about um, an image of the world, right? If it's just a circle, it looks flat, but with latitude and longitude lines, it looks volumetric. So if it's helpful, you can think about cross contour lines as the latitude and longitude of an object that you're drawing. In this unit, I'm going to teach you how to work with measured drawing. So rather than relying on a grid, in this method, the artist has to just draw from observation, as you can see in this example. When you measure a drawing, you're using a straight, consistent optical measuring tool like a pencil, as you can see right here, to establish the height, width, and the angles in a form. All right, so you can see that his arm is fully extended out, and if his elbow were bent towards himself, it would mean that the pencil becomes larger to his eyes. But if it's always extended fully out with his, with his elbow out, it's always going to be the same distance. And so that creates cons consistency. And you'll see it in the demonstration video that I'm going to make. If you, um, if you hold your pencil vertically up and down, you can get the height um, of that cone, for example. If you turn it side to side, you can get a measurement of the width. And then you can also... Um, line the edge of that pencil up with the edges of the form to understand the angles. Um, in our class we also have some clocks printed on a transparency so you can think about um, angles as for example this is a two o'clock angle or a six o'clock angle. More on that later. Organizational line. So in a measured drawing this is usually the first step. An organizational line is a method of dissecting an object into inner and outer side lines to establish scales and angle. 
And so when you measure with that pencil or whatever straight tool you're using, you are thinking about from this edge to this edge. All right, so it's that tall. Then you're thinking about from this edge to this edge, and it comes to be about a square. So the height and the width are the same, um, the same unit of measurement. And so they drew, they drew out a square then, and then they drew, drew that in half. So they could think about the different four quadrants of that drawing. Okay, so they established the height and the width, and then started to think about the angles. So that's where all these lines come in. You can, they're, before they even draw that 3D form, the jug or whatever this is, they had to draw in these lines that show the angle first. And that's going to really help with the contour line. So you can see at the first step, this is um, this could be an example of this drawing. No objects drawn yet, just lines. Now this happens before you start to draw um, forms within the object, and that's what I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Um, this square out here. Um, defines the edges of your objects in a still life and that's something I will refer to as the bounding box, the box that bounds everything inside of it. The next step in a measured drawing is to simplify objects into geometric shapes um, or forms. So <clears throat> in this example here you can see that the the proportions have been established, but now we're trying to make this little figure appear more round. So, oops. so for example, in the elbow and the wrist, the knees and the thighs, they have drawn circles or ellipses. Um, so an ellipse is just a circle tilted at an angle, and we're going to practice a lot with drawing ellipses in this course very important for a volumetric drawing. And then other shapes. Um, this looks like a cone. 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 There's a sphere for the head. Um, there appears to be some cubes for the fingers, for example. Now, this will help create the more convincing volume, mass, and proportions. And at this step, you have to pretend that you can see through an object. If you just focus on the outer edges, oftentimes, as you're just starting out drawing, it will appear to be very flat, like it's a cookie cutter out of a piece of paper. All right. Planar analysis will be the last step of the drawing for this unit. Um, so like I said, a plane is a flat surface. It shows volume, direction, and angles. So you can think about it as the side of something. Planar analysis is a drawing technique in which you take an object that is organic and curved, such as a hand in this example, and then transform it into flat geometric planes. And so you can tell that they were thinking about this as a plane, transforming it into a rectangle. This one is going, it's a rectangle going at a different angle. This is a rectangle going at another angle. So the, just the top of that finger, you can see with those three shapes that they added, that you can see where the joints are in the fingers, for example. It indicates where the bones are. It also indicates that the finger is resting on a surface of some kind. Now, this sounds like a crazy way to draw, but it really helps you to understand how things have volume, and it helps you understand the edges of an object in a more complex way than just contour lines. So I'm going to introduce you to an artist that you likely already know who used planar analysis in their work, Pablo Picasso. Now, Picasso was a Spanish artist working in the early 20th century, and he was one of the grandfathers of abstraction in European art specifically. And uh, with uh, another artist named Brock, he in invented a new movement of art called Cubism. And there were 
two types. We're going to talk about analytical cubism. So in this example here, in his painting, would be an example of analytical cubism. And so the artist would analyze the different planes of an object and then try to draw them at multiple perspectives. So not just, so in this goat skull, for example, you can see the sides and the front at the same time. So he did this on purpose and he had to use, um, he used planar analysis to think about the different sides of an object and showing multiple sides at the same time. All right. And this was very influential and groundbreaking in the field of art because artists typically just wanted to copy things like they saw in real life. So that would mean that as a human, you can only see things in one perspective at a time. Now, this was a big departure from that long tradition and where abstraction began, began to become more abstraction there from there on out opened up so many doors in the context of Western art. Allison Knuth is a contemporary artist based in California and she also used planar analysis in her work. She primarily does design, graphic design, that is drawing and painting, and oftentimes is commissioned to do murals. And she is known for her linear geometric portraits and landscapes um, and applying planar analysis to them. Here's an example of some of her work. Um, everybody will do a planar analysis a little bit differently um, so there's not always a right or wrong way to go about it, but you can see that everyone could have a little different style. I like how she added all these parallel hatched lines to show the various areas that have value to them. I think that definitely makes it look even more three-dimensional. Here's another example of planar analysis. For example, these two triangles here in the hand, that shows where the, to me, that's that shows where the bone is, where the thumb connects to the other, like, major hand bones. And that, even just those two shapes dissected, make a lot more sense to me. If that line were not there, it would look like it's just one plane or just one side of a form. Memento mori is a conceptual um, aspect that we're going to explore in this unit. So in this unit you're going to be making a still life and doing a planar analysis from it. Now this is a prominent artistic genre in, it was a prominent artistic genre in 16th century Europe. The Latin translation is remember that you will die. So in Memento Mori paintings they're, they chose objects and place them together into a still life such as this and all three of these objects really represent time or make you remember that time is passing um, with each and every moment so there's a skull it's facing us rem reminds us that someday that will be us flowers are beautiful but they only last a few days they they you know really change quickly over time and then of course this um, sand clock. What is it called? And then of course the hourglass which reminds you that time is running out for example. Vanitas still life is sort of another version of Memento Mori also a 16th century genre specific to the Netherlands and this explored uh, topics of beauty and earthly attachments. So things that humans really want to hold on to while they're alive, but also a rem reminder that eventually we will be gone and all of these objects will be left behind. 